just one time I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line Through a land so white and savage And make a Northwest Passage to From the Davis Strait as there it was said to lie The sea route to the Orient for which so many died Seeking gold and glory, leaving weathered broken bones And a long forgotten lonely cat of stones Ah, for just one time I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line through a land so white and savage And make a northwest passage to the sea Driving hard across the plain ah, For just one time I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line Through a land so white and savage And make a Northwest Passage to which is a song written by the Canadian folk singer Stan Rogers, um, who was active, I think, in about the 1970s or 80s, um, and sadly died uh, very young, um, before his time, in a plane fire. Um, uh, someone was smoking in the um, toilets. I think it was already illegal at that point, in a plane anyway. Um, and it caught fire, and Stan Rogers was among the people who died. The plane was sitting on the, on the runway. Um, so he um, is one of my favourite uh, folk singers, one of my favourite um, artists. So I'm probably going to be singing quite a lot of different songs by him as the academic community continues. Um, and Northwest Passage is, as you may have gathered, um, it is about the Franklin expedition to attempt to find a Northwest Passage um, from the uh, from, from from North Canada through to the Orient.
brilliant. Um, and so he, um, this song has become essentially the unofficial national anthem of Canada. Um, there's a wonderful, um, there's a TV show, um, I think it's called Due South, and it's about a, uh, it's a Canadian um, Mountie who ends up being sent down uh, to, to work somewhere in America on a sort of weird exchange thing. Um, and there's a scene where he and his uh, colleague are on a, for some reason, on a freight ship. Um, and they're attempting to uncover a crime um, and he is distracting the crew by getting them to have a whole sing-along to the Northwest Passage. Um, so uh, one of the sort of heroes of history in which I'm very interested um, sort of on a personal level uh, rather than through my academic research is uh, Arctic exploration um, and more related mountaineering of the early 20th century, the late 19th century there to me very close because they're, they're being motivated by the same sort of senses of imperialism and heroism and I just find um, the various Arctic and Antarctic expeditions incredibly fascinating. Um, there is also in fact one of the best uh, historical novels I've ever read was about uh, the Northwest Passage, it's called The Terror. Um, the name of the author escapes me at this exact moment and it's, it's not entirely um, realistic, there is a giant flesh-eating monster which is sort of so it crosses over into fantasy but in terms of capturing the texture of life on board um, the Terra and the Erebus when they were stuck in the ice sort of imagining what what happened after um, any news of the expedition after the expedition vanished um, and also I think capturing some of the personalities involved um, and giving sort of one particular historical angle on, on what Franklin was like um, uh, so there's a certain sort of train of thought which argues that he was quite, um, that he wasn't competent for what he did. Um, and this book, in sort of imagining what happened, certainly sort of lays the blame for the expedition failing and dying at his door. Um, so that, that that's great fun. Uh, and I would definitely recommend reading it. Dan Simmons, that's the name of the author, Dan Simmons. Um, so I'm sorry in advance if this podcast is a bit, has me going, oh, um, a bit more, um, I'm driving at about, it's 20 past 8, so the A9 is a little bit busier than it was the last time I drove through. Um, so I'm having to sort of be a bit more focusing on the road and making sure I'm not um, doing anything stupid. Uh, so apologies in advance for that. Um, so what's the news? What am I up to right now? So it is Monday of the sec my second week at work. Um, probably in about week four I'll stop counting it in those terms, but currently it still is very much sort of the milestones based on how far I am through the job. Um, so my second week, my second week at work, um, my parents-in-law um, who live in America uh, arrived in the country on Friday last week, so we've sort of been um, balancing hosting them and showing them things around the uh, around where we live um, with getting out getting work done um, so it's quite it's quite busy at the moment for me um, and then next week there might not be a podcast next week because next week I'm going with my parents-in-law down to Annick um, just south of the, the Scottish border and we are meeting my parents for a, a sort of giant parent fest uh, in a we call it cottage in Annick uh, we find it works out quite well because my parents live in Suffolk um, so it's quite a long way to take my parents-in-law to, to visit them and have any time with them um, so we find that meeting halfway in the middle means that then everyone gets a little bit of a, a holiday um, and they get to spend some time together and we get to have some time where you know we're not the we're not the only we're not the sole focus <laughs> of, of their visit which is um, which is fun so it's quite nice to have that sort of time so yeah next week there probably won't be a podcast because uh, I think it would be a little bit awkward trying to record an academic commute with my parents-in-law in the car behind me um, although that could be quite fun we could have sort of a conversation no maybe not um, so what I would like to talk about today is what do academics do um, so I think I often make I, I, I maintain a blog um, called the historian's desk and I've made jokes a few times on it about you know my mother doesn't even know what it is I spend my days doing um, and this is partly a joke but it also sort of captures a, a real truth which is that uh, I think it can seem from outside of academia very vague as to what exactly us academics who are of course 
partly paid for out of the public purse, what, what are we doing with our time? Um, so well, I have two older brothers. One of my brothers, my, my the brother is immediately above me in age, rather than my eldest brother, is a quantity surveyor. And when I was, I think I was visiting home from university, and I turned to him at the dinner table and I said, Tom, what what do you do? What does it mean? What, what is being a quantity surveyor? What, what, what is that? What do you do with your days? And he sort of sighed and he said, well, you know, drive into work, get into work, check my emails, I answer some emails, um, then I play on the internet for a bit, I check my emails again, then I, you know, play a game of solitaire, check my emails again, answer some emails. Um, and <laughs> of course, um, I think this was my elder brother trying to uh, come across as very cool to his little sister. Um, and I'm sure he does a lot more than that, although I must confess I'm still a little unclear as to exactly what a quantity surveyor does. I think it has something to do with sort of making sure that there are enough of each um, the sort of overseeing building sites and making sure that um, any supplies are of the correct amount and in the correct place. Um, but that could be totally wrong. Um, so I don't understand what he does and I'm sure he has a pretty similar impression of what I do. Um, <laughs> so what does an academic do? What does an average, oh my god, you don't enter the dual carriageway at 20 miles an hour. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I had to do some hasty manoeuvring there. Um, so I'm sort of going to talk about kind of the research process, what, what is the, um, also sort of kind of what is the daily sort of life of an academic, or from my perspective, obviously. Um, and I think it does very much depend on subject and career stage and all sorts of other things. So this is just one sort of one viewpoint on, on, on this particular subject. Um, so I think the give answer, if someone said, you know, what do you do? You're an academic, you're a researcher, what is it you do? Um, within my subject, um, and within I think a, a large chunk of the arts and humanities, the, the glib answer would be, well, I, I read a load of books and then I write books, um, which is true to a certain extent, but is, does of course not entirely capture the whole um, the whole range of activities and exactly what that reading and that writing involves. Um, so right now, I'm at the very start of a new project, and it's quite strange. So doing a PhD. Your main job is to write a book. A uh, thesis is a set, you know, in terms of its length, it's a book. Um, you're, you're, you're sitting down, you're researching a single topic, and then you are producing a book. Um, and doing this postdoc, it's quite different because the aim of the postdoc is to produce several articles, which strikes me as quite frightening in a way for me because it means that I have to think much more quickly and come up with sort of what it is I want to say in a given article in a much shorter span of time. So I've got, say, you know, seven months, eight months for each article I'm writing. Um, and so it's very nice when you're doing a PhD because you can read and then you can think and then you can read some more. Um, but let's just talk, so I'll talk about what my plans are for the day today and I'll try and sort of explain how that fits into the sort of overall context of doing um, of being an academic and how that would then extend over a sort of long term. Um, so once I get into the office, I, I certainly will. I will turn on my, my computer. I have a new, oh God, that was so exciting. Um, I have a desktop bought for me as part of my job, um, which is a real novelty, um, having spent the last ooh, eight years working on my own laptop and sort of getting all sorts of shoulder pain for being hunched over and, uh, and now I have a desktop and it's sort of like oh my gosh my shoulders are expanding because I'm suddenly using a mouse and I'm looking up at the screen which is at the height my neck should be rather than me bending down over it so that is a great pleasure um, and so I'll get on I'll get into the office I will turn on the laptop I will pour a cup of coffee from my thermos flask um, and I will indeed check my emails and answer my emails um, it, it, really is a uh, sort of keeping on top of emails and communication is a big part of the academic job because any academic whether a PhD student or a professor or anywhere in between has a lot of responsibilities in addition to just doing their research so they're going to be teaching they might have administrative roles they might be for example coordinating um, a course um, and they're going to be getting all sorts of emails about all of these different things and having to sort of organize and plan and respond to these and not 
quite a lot of these emails are pretty time sensitive, you have to respond quickly, and even if they're not, there are so many of them that if you don't reply to them pretty promptly, they're just going to build up and build up and build up. Um, so it wasn't so bad for me when I was a PhD student, but my husband um, is a lecturer at Stirling University. When we went on to ho went to holiday um, a few months ago, he then uh, opened his email after coming back from holiday. He had something like 200 after a week away, um, and probably you know 100 of those were spam. But he's glad 100 emails that he had to sort of think about and respond to and and react to. So there are there is a lot of there's a lot of emailing. So my brother's my brother's job sort of layout, you know, getting work, open my email, answer the email. That's exactly the same for me. Um, probably the next step, whilst I'm feeling fairly fresh, would be a bit of project planning. So I think that something else which is important to bear in mind is that, in my experience anyway, academics really have to be project managers as well as just researchers. So because there are all of these different things you have to, to worry about, um, beyond just research, you have to sort of figure out, well, how are these all fitting in with my daily work? How am I going to make sure that, you know, I've got, so, I don't know, so, so currently, let's just look at my stuff. I am uh, teaching a lecture or two in the autumn semester. I am organising various, I'm running various workshops. I am doing a couple of seminars. Um, I am also committed to writing a review of a book for a journal um, and I've also got um, a couple of conferences that I'm going to in the, in, in the early autumn and I also have to be researching and preparing my first article uh, and also for the project that I'm working on for my postdoc sort of thinking about how that project is going to run so one of the elements of the of the project is to have run a conference and produce an edited volume which is a volume um, it's a book which has got chapters written by different authors and the aim is to get all of these authors together uh, talk about what we're going to contribute and then and then have these articles or chapters written up and put together um, this all has to happen over the next three years um, and all the things I mentioned previous that have to happen over the next six months so part of for me academic life is sitting down and you know working with your calendar Gantt charting doing all sorts of really um, finickety sort of project planning to make sure that you're carving out time for all of the different tasks that you need to do and those tasks are so many more than just living the life of the mind and reading books. Um, but then after I've done that I am in fact going to go to the library because I, I do need to be doing some reading of books. Um, so last week I started um, doing some sort of searching through the library catalogue to sit here but it's now just to see what books the library has available that would be useful to me for uh, my first article. Um, so it might be helpful to explain at this point exactly what the project is I'm doing and what, what I'm currently working on. So the project is called um, uh, <laughs> Mountains in Ancient Literature and Culture and their Post-Classical Reception um, and that, that sounds complex and a bit wordy but basically what it means is um, there are sort of two halves of the project but they do very much overlap and the first half is mountains in ancient literature and culture and that's going to be what my my principal investigator my boss is, is going to be working on that's his area of research he's looking at how did people um, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome how did they think about mountains what did they write about them did they you know how did they react to the mountains and what did they uh, and then my half is sort of looking at how are those ideas that were articulated by uh, the classical authors, how are these ideas received, uh, what impact do they have in later eras, do they actually affect the way that people experience mountains um, all the way up to the 18th, 19th centuries and even today. Uh, and obviously of course some of, because an inherent part of the project is making this connection, it's, it's saying, you know, there, it's trying to, it, one of the hypotheses is that there is this connection between ancient reactions to mountains and, and more modern reactions to mountains. So obviously both um, my PI and I are going to kind of overlap, so he's going to be looking forwards and I'm going to be looking backwards. Um, so it's not entirely a straightforward break, but that, that is a sort of rough approximation of how it works. Uh, and the basic remit of my post is to produce four articles 
articles or or the equivalent um, so it could be you know, two articles in a book uh, or, or whatever but currently I'm working on sort of planning and preparing to write my first article and the, one of the problems and pleasures of doing academic research is that what you're planning on writing changes with every single different book you read um, so I was originally planning on doing an article that was about um, mountains as sites of memory as sites of classical memory um, from about the 17th century through to the 19th century so looking at how visitors to um, Greece and uh, to Greece and Italy um, in the, in the um, early modern and modern periods how they look at these mountains and sort of their reactions to these mountains are informed by having read all of these classical texts how do they sort of say oh well you know this is this is Mount Parnassus this is the home scene of the Muses or this is Vesuvius this was you know this was Vulcan's Forge how are they sort of receiving these um, classical ideas and oh my goodness we've got quite a tale back here um, so moving slower and hopefully I'll be able to talk a bit more focusedly. Um, so that was what I started out wanting to look at. I wanted to look at sort of, you know, this idea of um, the landscapers as containing these memories of the past in general and then to focus particularly on Mount Parnassus which is in Greece and is sort of legendarily known as the seat of the muses um, and then also to look at Mount Etna in Italy which is of course the, um, the volcano um, which has erupted many times very famously um, and so what I've decided, decided that I would like to start by sort of looking up literature on Mount Etna and trying to find any primary sources that I should start with um, and that was what I was doing last week was sort of doing a bit of an overview of what is out there uh, and the ironic thing is that of course even in just doing that brief overview I've started to think well maybe it just needs to be a, an article on volcanoes uh, maybe it just needs to be an article on Mount Etna because there is so much out there and this is the constant sort of tension as you have these ideas and then you realize that the material is a lot is a lot more than you can ever look at um, so there's a concept in history and, and in other related disciplines of um, secondary and primary literature and so primary literature is the stuff for me that was written in the period it's the things which it, it, it's the you know it's the 17th century writing or indeed the classical writings it's the things that people wrote um, when they were, it's the stuff that is the subject of my article if, if I'm looking at how people in the 17th through to the 19th centuries looked at Man Etna the primary sources are going to be the travel accounts of people in that period who are going to Man Etna and then the secondary literature is things that other historians or scholars have written about um, have written about Mount Etna, about travellers, about the classics um, and all of that is sort of helping me because the idea with, with academia is that you're never reinventing the wheel you're always starting from standing on the shoulders of other people having done research so you're trying to make the next sort of step and the next contribution you're not starting from ground zero every single time so I'm looking so 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 I, I, and I tend to with my PhD I started out by sticking just to looking at the primary literature and then going and reading the secondary literature afterwards because what I wanted to do is to be able to look at these primary sources without any preconceptions and then having read them and sort of drawn my own sort of conclusions to then go and look at the secondary literature and to see how my conclusions compared with those of other other people because I think that sometimes it can be very easy um, and was definitely the case in what I was studying for my PhD that that people take so much as a given what the secondary literature says that they then read the primary sources solely through that lens and they don't necessarily pick up on everything the primary sources are saying because they have been taught to expect a certain thing from the secondary literature but in this case because I feel that you know like but even basic stuff like what were the dates of the eruptions of Etna what were the key classical authors who I should be looking out for being mentioned in the later texts so I'm going I'm going to be going to the library and picking up a big pile both of secondary literature and also of um, a few primary sources 
Um, of course, a lot of the primary sources that I need are, you know, rare books from the 18th and 19th century. So these are things I can only see in the special collections in the university library. So I can't take them out. Um, so in the first instance, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick up all of the books that I can just carry out and put into my office. Um, and I'm going to start by reading one um, secondary source. And I think that, um, so I did a, pro a research project with a perfume maker in between my PhD and getting the postdoc. Uh, and I remember making the proposal for the research I was going to do and someone who's reading it said, oh, you know, don't say you're going to read a hundred books because to someone who's not an academic, that sounds like it would take forever. <laughs> um, so reading <laughs> and taking notes on something it's a different approach to reading. It's very much sort of like going into a book and sort of picking out the bits you need using the index to find the specific things you want rather than reading it from cover to cover and with great sort of intensity. Uh, so I intend to hopefully sort of read and make notes on two different books today. The first one will be a piece of secondary literature and then the second one is going to be a, um, a primary source. There is a, a poem by a either a 15th or a 16th century uh, humanist scholar about climbing Mount Etna and I to my mild shame given the topic of my PhD had not come across this before so I'm quite excited to have a look into that and see where it fits into what I've already read um, so yeah so that's gonna be the the, 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 the one of the things I'm doing um, I'm also having coffee with a colleague so uh, the horrible way of putting this, the sort of callous way of saying, you know, networking is a big part of academic life. Um, I actually think it's nicer to say that in terms of sort of the context today, it's about making links with people that you're going to be working with. Um, and I think it is important to take time out or, you know, to take a break from doing your work to sort of get to know the people you're working with and to um, have a bit of time just having human interaction in between all of this sort of very intensive um, reading and analysis. Um, so that's just one day, but how do we sort of expand that out over the sort of long term? So probably over the next few weeks I'm going to be doing a lot of reading of these different sources, both primary and secondary. And as time goes on, so normally, so what I found with my thesis is that as I did all this reading I kept coming up with new plans and new ideas for what I would write in the thesis and in each chapter and which different sources would be dealt with in different places um, and so but I actually wrote my thesis plan about five different times and each one was radically different uh, so I think one of the key points about academic research is that it is in fact a sort of constant process of adaptation and evolution of an idea so you start out with an idea you know I want to write about X or I have a theory that, that, that such and such a thing is the case and I want to go and see whether or not that's true um, and so that's your starting idea and you might have a sense of what form the article will take eventually but then you go in and you even start reading even once you've read a dozen pieces of material you start to think oh well maybe maybe my original hypothesis needs to be adapted um, or maybe the topic I'd originally set for myself isn't the most coherent or interesting topic uh, maybe there's something even more interesting to look at and so then you adapt that and then you sort of start looking you, you do another search for literature based on these new ideas and it sort of is constant this constant sort of process of re-evaluating your original ideas and your original plans and trying to figure out what is the most exciting and interesting and co coherent thing to write about and the thing is that history is so incredibly rich that with any one sort of starting idea there are probably 10 different articles that could be written but you of course don't necessarily have time <laughs> you don't have time to write all 10 articles so you have to um, decide and move and I think that for me anyway it's so rewarding to constantly be sort of adapting and changing my ideas rather than just saying oh but I said I was going to write about Parnassus and Etna I want to write about both of them and I want to write about, class write about classical memory but then to go okay maybe there's something really interesting here about volcanoes maybe I should write about those instead um, and then adapting your reading and your sort of focus based on that um, so I think yeah so uh, to say it's just reading and writing is is a glib response and is really doesn't really capture the sort of the the the, the, the back and forth process from planning acting you know planning then reading 
doing a bit of writing and then coming back and replanning and rereading and re you know and rewriting and sort of constantly going backwards and forwards. Um, and so then I guess another big part of sort of what academics do, if you're talking in terms of how do they get from having if you're talking about just research and about producing research and producing writing um, you have the idea you go and you read you have that back and forth process um, and then eventually you write something um, and I'm going to talk more about academic approaches to writing in another podcast um, and eventually you write something and then you need to get it published and the process of academic publication is by no means as straightforward as one might imagine it to be um, so another big part of the project planning um, in sort of planning you know your long-term goals is figuring out both where you want to submit an article for consideration and also then think about you know how long does that mean it will take for the article to potentially be published um, so most academic writing is published in things called journals uh, which are just collections of articles the articles are generally about 8,000 to 10,000 words long um, and there are a vast number of different academic journals many some of them are very generalist some of them have specific very specific focuses um, and you have to think very carefully about where you're going to try and place your article but say you've then decided you want to publish your article in um, past and present which is a, a very prominent um, uh, history journal um, and publishes things on, on all sorts of eras and topics um, so you then submit your article to the editor um, and the editor will then decide whether or not it is worth sending it off for peer review um, and peer review is a process whereby um, the journal selects two or three academics who they think um, are qualified to comment on what you have written on the topic of what you've written um, and then it gets sent out to the peer reviewers if it doesn't if the editor just says well no this isn't appropriate uh, we're the journal of Scottish history and, you, and you've written something about Welsh history what what um, then you get a, de a desk rejection um, and then you're, you're back on square one and you're trying to find somewhere else to send it um, but if it gets sent out to peer review the, the peer reviewers will then read the article written very carefully and they will then send it uh, they will then send it back to the editor with um, both comments on the article and also a recommendation as to whether it should be published in their journal and that can be sort of they can give a number of different recommendations they can say publish uh, without corrections which means it's perfect which never happens um, or they can say um, uh, publish with minor corrections or they can say revise and resubmit which is where they say you know there's a kernel of an idea here that would be really good for this journal but it's currently not of the quality it needs to be so recommending that the author make substantive revisions and then resubmit it to the same journal um, and this process of course takes time uh, because the peer reviewing is essentially something that academics is another thing to, to, to include in the Gantt charts of what you do uh, in any given semester so it's another thing for academics to, to fit in um, and so the peer review process can take quite a lo long time um, months indeed um, and so sometimes it can be you know probably six months is about the average time from submitting a, a, an article to a journal and getting a peer review back um, and then of course after peer review you have to do any revisions that they suggest um, and then you have to get it um, then it has to be um, typeset and proofread and then finally is published probably about a year after you submitted it so there's this sort of other clock you have to be thinking about when you're sort of thinking well I want to write an article uh, you might want to be thinking about not just when you want to write it but also when you would want it to be published because um, say if you're applying for a job you want your articles to be out or at least forthcoming so that you can put them on your CV and so that you know you can say I've been through peer review and people have said my work is worth publishing um, so that process can take a long time and also depending on the journal you submit to um, so past and present because it's such a prominent journal because it's so general so many people submit to it that it takes a lot longer so I think the lead you know you could easily spend sort of a year and a half two years from the original submission to getting it actually in print um, so that's another thing to consider in terms of that whole project planning so it is about sort of there are multiple different plates and you have to keep them spinning and even when you're sort of doing just the research element you need to think about well how is this research ultimately going to get out there when is it going to get out there how does that affect um, 
how does that affect my career plans and also how does that affect sort of even just the links you can make between articles because certainly with the kind of work I'm doing I'll probably want to be sort of making references to my other articles to say um, you know this is one element of, of the study uh, of reactions to mountains um, if you want to find more go look at this other article but if they're not published in or in the order they were written uh, that that can get a bit confusing so that's um, I think that's probably the kind of the process um, a little bit of an insight maybe into into what academics do from day to day um, I hope it doesn't sound boring I find it incredibly exciting oh yes the other thing I'm going to be doing today um, which is not a hundred percent sort of necessity and not necessarily something that all academics will be doing but I'm going to be um, doing some Greek learning oh sorry mm. uh, so I decided that um, so I'm now in a classics faculty um, and even though I'm not I don't necessarily have to read the uh, original Greek and, and Latin texts in the original language I can read them in translation most of the authors in the and, and most of the, the you know the authors I'm going to be reading from the 17th century onwards are writing in English um, these were also authors who had the classical languages and will be themselves quoting things in Greek in Latin um, and so I would like to at least be able to sort of have the capacity to, to transliterate and translate and, and try and recognize some of the stuff they're talking about and to be able to go back and look at a few of the sources that uh, you know a few of the classical texts that they're referring to and to make a stab at reading them in the language that they would have read it, read them in um, so I have a very little bit of Latin um, but I never really got on terribly well with Latin so I decided to start from sort of with a fresh slate and have a go at learning some Greek uh, so I've got the alphabet and uh, the um, first person present tense, no, not first person, I've got the, the, the present tense verbs down, uh, the conjugation for, 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 for the present tense, and I have ten different verbs that I now know. Um, so it's very basic at the moment. So I'm, I'm going to spend about an hour today sort of working through the next few pages of the of the textbook that I've, that I've bought. Um, and just try and improve on that so yeah that's another element of um, the academic life is recognizing what are the um, an academic work is what are the skills that I need to make my scholarship as good as possible and then taking time to learn and develop those skills because you know you can't um, you don't you, you know if you're by being an academic and by writing on these topics you are taking on the role of being an expert on these things and you need to be able to do that honestly and to say yes I have the skills necessary to understand this from as many different angles as possible so that's why I'm learning Greek and it's the reason why you know many uh, academics will take time to learn new languages or to you know improve their paleography which is the, the reading of um, handwriting handwriting oh. Um, I can't decide whether or not I'd rather be uh, reading 17th century handwriting uh, which is relatively standard but looks really weird and funky compared to modern day handwriting or whether I would rather be reading like you know 1970s handwriting which is not standardized and can be pretty squirrely but um, yeah it's a difficult decision actually anyway so there's that also that element of sort of like just basically what are the skills you need to understand the sources you're looking at as fully as possible so I think that's pretty much everything I can say about what does an academic do uh, so now I'm gonna wrap up with the outside of academia section which I of course forgot to include in my first podcast and I decided that what I'm gonna do is um, it's my podcast so I'm gonna reserve the right to um, separate out sort of the outside of academia section if there's something I want to talk about at more length like Magic the Gathering um, and have a sort of separate podcast uh, sub-series of outside of a beyond academia um, and then have sort of the leave sort of shorter things for the end of each podcast um, because there's a certain I'm currently about to reach the point on my drive in where I need to start concentrating even more and so the podcast kind of comes to a natural end at about that point but today I'm going to talk just briefly about making smoothies um, so something that has been giving me a lot of pleasure in my day-to-day -day life over the past couple of weeks has been um, having a smoothie maker. A few weeks ago my husband and I were at dinner with a friend who is also um, a historian and he 
he made us a smoothie with his smoothie maker, which was some sort of ni Nutri Ninja or something like that, or some sort of exciting name. Um, and I was looking at it, I thought this was a fantastic idea because I have quite a sweet tooth and I also have quite a fast metabolism, so I often get hungry during the day. Um, and the problem is, it's terribly easy to just snack on unhealthy things like cookies because they give you a quick sugar high. Um, but they're, of course, not very good for you and all of that. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm becoming terribly middle-aged and worrying about sort of being healthy and nutritious. Uh, so I decided, I thought, you know, that would be a really good idea because smoothies are incredibly, um, I find them really tasty and sort of quite a nice treat. So I thought, well, why don't we get a smoothie maker? Um, and so now about once a day, I will go downstairs, got a load of frozen fruit in the fridge, freezer, freezer obviously, um, otherwise it wouldn't be frozen, and just chuck it into the smoothie maker. Um, and it blitzes it wonderfully. Um, I feel like the technology has come in a lot since sort of like 10 years ago when I just tried to use a hand blender and you end up with sort of this soggy mush. Um, and then have a smoothie. Um, I in fact have one in a thermos flask for work today, which is a raspberry, mango, pineapple and banana smoothie with a little bit of apple juice. Um, and that will hopefully sort of uh, prevent me from you know, just going to Sainsbury's or Pret and picking up like a cookie or a sort of cereal bar or whatever, which is just packed with sugar. Um, well, obviously, a smoothie is packed with sugar, but different types of sugars. So that is just um, one little thing. I wish I had discovered it during my PhD. Um, I think it would have been a nice way to uh, motivate myself during the thesis rather than just eating loads of biscuits. Um, so that is one element of my life beyond academia. Um, so. Hello to anyone who is listening, I just want to make a bit of a call out. Um, if anyone is listening on YouTube, uh, please do like the video or even subscribe if you fancy it. Um, I don't know exactly what benefit it has, but it makes me feel like there are people listening, which is a, which is a nice thing. Um, and please, please say if there are any comments you have or any ideas, um, anything 